I want you to make sure that you understand one thing for sure as we go through this morning and, and I share with you some of the ministry impact that you've had. This is not my ministry. This is our ministry. There is no way that I can do this ministry without you. Without your partnership, we cannot continue to reach other people around the world. And I want to thank you so much for enabling us to go and serve around the world. Uh, when you look at those pictures, when you look at the video, I hope you understand that we're doing more than medical care because the medical part of our ministry is the smallest component and it's probably the least important. The most important thing that we do is telling people about Jesus Christ. Because if all we do is give people medicine, if all we do is give them glasses and dental procedures and surgical procedures, we're not helping them really at all because our human bodies are frail. They're going to continue to deteriorate. Uh, people are going to need stronger glasses. They're probably going to need more medications after those run out. They're going to need more dental procedures. But if I can tell them how much Jesus Christ loves them and that they can know for a fact that heaven is their home, that changes everything. Uh, we were in the Philippines, and we had had a really rough week. Uh, it was one of the, the most emotionally draining clinics we had ever had. I mean, all day long, it was just major case after major case walking in the door. And I was sitting in the pharmacy doing some work when one of our ER physicians walked up to me, and she was just crying uncontrollably. And She said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I know this is unprofessional for me to be crying, she said, but it's been one of those days today. And she said, and right now there's a man at my, my station. He's He's going to die any moment. She said his blood pressure is falling quickly. He's in end stages of tuberculosis and he knows it and he's about to die. I said, well, okay, well, we got to do something. He, we can't have him die at your station. Uh, it might scare everyone else and, and we don't want people to think we've done something. Plus, uh, we want to give him dignity. So I, I walked down and I picked him up and I took him into a, a spare room that was on the side of where we were working. There was a bed and, and I laid him down and uh, we asked the nurses to start some IV fluids and get his pressure back up for a, as much as we could to help him. And uh, I looked at the gentleman. I said, sir, I said, do you know that you have end stages of tuberculosis? And he said, yes. I said, you know that the doctors here in the Philippines, they've done everything they can to help you with this, and, and there's nothing that they can do. He said, yes. I said, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do either. It's just too far advanced. I said, sir, do you know that you're going to die? And he very stoically just nodded his head. He said, yes. I looked at his wife. I said, do you understand all this as well? She, she nodded her head. Yes, she, she did. And I looked back at the man. I said, but sir, do you know what happens once you die? Do you know what happens next? And that stoic look on his face melted away as his bottom lip just began to quiver. Tears filled his eyes and he looked at me and said, no, I have no idea. I was thankful to be able to call one of the pastors from the local church to come in and in Tagalog, in his heart language, to be able to hear how much Jesus Christ loves him, how it doesn't matter how the rest of his life was spent, that right here, right now, if you'll trust Jesus Christ as your one and only Savior, you can know for sure that when you close your eyes on this side to open them in eternity with Jesus Christ, knowing forgiveness and peace and joy what hope we are able to offer other people. And this is because of you partnering with us that we can go and do this. Uh, you know that um, COVID kind of sent everything into a loop. Didn't it? I mean, it has changed our world. Before COVID hit, we were thankful to get two trips in at least. We were able to work in the Philippines and down in Peru. And as we were working in both of those locations, we were glad that 3,620 patients came through our clinics during those two weeks of work. And we were thankful to be able to serve all of them. But we were more thankful to know that over 517 people trusted Christ as their personal Savior. This is fruit to your account. This is the reason why we give. This is the reason why we go. And I want to encourage you to consider going. I want to consider, I want you to consider and pray uh, fervently about God using you on one of our trips. Now, if you're here this morning and you're a medical professional, we got a couple of those here this morning that I, I know already. Uh, I, I want you to consider being a part of our ministry. If you're a medical professional, that is a God-given skill, isn't it? Because not everybody can handle the blood and the guts and the sights and the smells of medicine, right? That's just not for everybody. Not everybody has the mental recall to know what to do in emergent situations, those kind of things. So listen, listen. 
If God has given you that skill set, whether you are an EMT, you're a paramedic, you are, you know, I tell people all the time, we'll go by their, their little acronyms or initials. If you're a D-O-M-D, R-N, you're a R-N-A, C-N-A, if you are a PharmD, if you got a J-R after your name, listen, I want you to travel with me, all right? Doesn't matter who you are, I want you to come with me. Give that skill set back to God one week this year. It would be an amazing blessing to others and it'll change your life. And if you're here this morning, you say, yes, Bradley, I hope they go. Listen, you're not off the hook either because if you're a non-medical professional, I want you to travel with us as well because we have non-medical professionals in here, non-medical volunteers that have come with us on trips, use their skill set. For every one medical professional, I need three non-medical volunteers to work alongside them so that we can actually accomplish these lofty goals of seeing thousands of people in our clinic. So pray about joining us. Uh, after service, I want you to stop by over at this table here, this table. We also have another table. Grab one of our prayer cards and pray for us, please. Would you just pray for safety, that God will keep us safe wherever we travel around the world, that God would give us open doors to be able to minister for him there. Pray for our safety. Would you also pray for the supplies? You would not believe how many latex gloves and masks and band-aids and vitamins and Tylenol and antibiotics and surgical kits and suturing material and all the different things that we go through in one year. It's enormous. Would you pray that God continues to supply all of the needs we have so that we can continue serving him? And then do pray for more servants. Uh, right now we have 387 people that are signed up to go on next year's trips. The problem is we have about 24 teams that are going to travel next year. I need at least 500 people. So we're still praying for an additional 113 people to join us. And I want it to be you. I want one of you to say, hey, listen, I can go. I can go and serve some Somewhere in this world, I can be a part of that. Pick up a couple of brochures that we have. This card right here, this green one, gives a quick synopsis of our ministry. It'll tell you who we are, what we do, why we do it, that kind of thing. This is actually really good if you know someone that's a medical professional. Grab one and pass it along. If you have a, a doctor's appointment this week or you're going to pick up your prescriptions or go see your dentist or, or go have your eyes checked, grab one of these and pass it along for us and invite them to be a part of our team. Even if they don't know Christ as their Savior, let me help you reach your medical community here in Las Vegas with the gospel of Jesus Christ because we've led a lot of doctors and nurses and other people People to the Lord when they went on trips with us. So we'd love to help you reach them. If you're interested in going, I want you to pick up one of these blue brochures. Uh, this one, when you open it and read it, it's going to tell you a little bit more about a trip and what it's like and how you'll be able to participate. It gives you some more in-depth information. But all of our information has our website on there that's got tons of stuff there. It also has our social media information so that you can connect with us by social media. There's tons of pictures and videos and testimonies of what God is doing. Listen, God has already used you. There, there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever. Uh, you've given financially. You, you, you partner in missions in a scriptural way. You give financially to help us go. Do you know that because you gave, uh, this year while we were in the Philippines, there was a young mother who had just given birth to a baby. She lost vision in one of her eyes during, uh, during the birth process and also had developed another issue where she was having seizures frequently. She had run out of money and had no longer, was no longer able to pick up her seizure medications. As a team, we prayed about how we could help her, and because we had a little bit of surplus money on hand, we were able to purchase several months worth of medication for her because I couldn't imagine what it would be like for that baby if something were to happen to that mother or what the other children think when mom has some type of seizure, and we wanted to be able to step in and help. Do you know we could do that because of you? because you give sacrificially, because you give financially. Uh, you not only give financially, you give in your resources. You do. I've already had some folks ask me, what about the glasses? Listen, do you know, I think it was last year, your church sent an entire pallet. I think there was like 16,000 pair of glasses that your church sent our ministry. We need at least 50,000 pair of glasses every year. You almost gave us half of our need for the entire year. We take those glasses and we clean them, we straighten them, we tighten them up, we run them through a lensometer, we label them, we bag them, we put them into boxes and prepare them to go out into the other parts of the world so that other people can have them. Uh, we were in West Africa. Cote d'Ivoire, West Africa, and I saw three ladies leaving the eye clinic, and they were all crying, and that's not usual for people to leave the eye clinic crying, and so I went over and I asked the director. I said, hey, what's going on? Why were those ladies crying? He said, Bradley, it was incredible. They came in. They all had lost their job at a local factory because they couldn't see well enough to thread a needle anymore. They no longer had an income to help take care of their family. They came. We matched them up with glasses. They were reading the bottom line of the vision charts, Bradley. They could see everything, and they were crying out of excitement because they were 
were going to get their jobs back. You impact people like that. And do you know all three of those ladies heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and know Jesus Christ loves them, that Jesus Christ can still provide because there is a healer. And you've given of yourself. I look around the room and I already see lots of faces. You've traveled with us before. You've given of yourself to go and to serve and to see it with your own eyes, how God is using these ministries to impact the world. And I want you to come back with us. Uh, we've served together in Tanzania. We've served together in El Salvador, in South Africa, in Vanuatu. And now let's take the next step. As a church, will you prayerfully consider traveling with us? I'm going to give you specific dates in a specific country that we're going to try to do as a church group. We're going to look at going to Romania together, and it's August the 19th through the 26th. Uh, if you don't have something to write that down, do me a favor, just grab one of the brochures. You can find that information on the website, or you can contact Pastor Neil Berkey. He'd be glad to help connect you with the church group, but we need your help. Remember I told you, we still have 113 spaces we need to fill. You could be part of that answer to our prayers. Our staff prays every single week at a specific time for God to help us. In fact, we have these two big bowls in our office that have these various color, uh, uh, they're, they're wool balls that come from South America. And we have one pot that already has 387, the other one has 113. And every day when God answers a prayer, it goes on our staff chat channel that we have as our secretary picks one up and she moves it over and answer to prayer. Be that answer to prayer, not only for us, but for that person that's in Romania that maybe feels hopeless, that feels helpless, Feels like no one has ever cared for them. No one's ever really taken the time to minister to them. Be the answer to their prayer by coming with us and helping us to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's absolutely our privilege and our honor to, to serve with you in this ministry. And we are so blessed to be able to be with you this weekend. Thank you so much, Liberty Baptist Church, for how you've blessed our ministry. I know I can speak for missionaries all over the world. Your church is absolutely a godsend that enables us to reach our communities for Jesus Christ. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Well, you can be involved in giving to missions. Take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, we've been looking at the early church, seeing that God sent them. God wanted them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We saw how uh, our first week of this month, we saw how to get involved in missions. We saw uh, how missions work is important to God. Last week we talked about what missionaries do and you saw that again. You saw what they are doing in different parts of the world even now. Today I want to talk about six reasons why I personally will be involved in Faith Promise this year. Why I personally will be involved in Faith Promise this year. You know, oftentimes we think that we are in just terrible straits. And we look around the world today, we think about the pandemic, we think about COVID-19, and we think, man, I've got to, when, when, when there's a panic situation, it's, it's easy to say, look, We've just got to back up and, and not do anything. We sort of go undercover like a, a turtle going into its shell, just afraid of what's going on. But we need to understand that is not the pattern we see in the New Testament. In the New Testament, Stephen had been, uh, Stephen had been brutally murdered. Uh, persecution had, had taken place. Uh, the, the people of God were scattered. They'd gone all the way up into Antioch, and we've seen this over the last several weeks. Now we come to the end of Acts chapter 11, and at the end of Acts chapter 11, the Bible tells us about a prophet who comes up to Antioch, and he prophesies about a, a time of trouble that is going to come. And you would think as he tells them the story of how things are going to get rough, that they would sort of back up and be afraid. But look what happens. The Bible says this, and in those days, verse 27, came the prophet, came prophets from Jerusalem to Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus. And signified by the Spirit, that is, he was, he was controlled by the Spirit, he was speaking from God, that there should be great dearth throughout all the world. There's going to be problems. There's going to be financial problems. There's going to be a famine. There's going to be problems worldwide throughout all the world. 
which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Well, you know, when you hear those bad words, it's, it's a bad, that bad things are going to happen, you, you think everybody just sort of clam up and pull back and say, well, we can't do anything. We've got to take care of number one. We've got to take care of our needs. But look what happened in verse 29. The Bible says, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which, they, which also they did. They didn't just talk about it. They determined based on their abilities that they were going to give even though it was told them that things were going to be tough. They determined to give according to their abilities. They determined to send relief under the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which they didn't just determine it. it just was, they weren't just talking, they did it, which also they did, and they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Father, I pray that you'd help me to communicate why it's important that all of us be involved in giving to missions. And Father, I pray as I share why I'm going to, I pray it'll inspire others to give to missions this year. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I hope you will pray with me as I am sharing with you why I'm gonna be involved in Faith Promise. You'll be praying about what God would have you to give on a week-by-week uh, basis to missions. Why, why, why would we, in a time of pandemic, in a time of trouble, globally and in our nation, why would we start thinking about giving to missions? Number one, number one, because of the commandment. You know, the Bible tells us Jesus has given us a commandment. In Luke chapter uh, six and verse 38, the Bible says give. We could stop right there, that's Jesus speaking. He's talking to his disciples about their life. He's talking to them about what they should be doing and he says, listen, here's what I want you to do, you be givers. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Just like Jesus gave us a commandment to pray, just as, as, as he has given us commandments to read his word, just like he's given us commandments in the Old Testament to do right and not to do wrong, he's given us this command and the command is to give. We ought to do, we ought to be givers because he told us to give. That's enough. That's enough. My dad was a beefy sort of guy. He was a big guy. He was a guy who I respected because he was big. He was also, he also knew how to discipline. Uh, maybe he was totally correct in his discipline. Maybe he wasn't. But I'll tell you what, I had a fear of my dad. My dad said, do something, and if you didn't do it, then he would motivate you. My dad had a belt that went around his waist, and it was a, it was a very big waist. Uh, not quite as big as yours, Joe, but it was a big waist. And he, he, had a, he, 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 he was like lightning speed of getting that belt off his waist and onto my backside when I disobeyed. It was amazing. He would say, do it, and I would say, but dad, and man, that thing was like, boom, boom, boom. it was like Zorro, uh, you know, and, and man, he could just give me, I had, I did what my dad told me to do because I had a fear of my father that if I didn't do it, then I was going to be in big trouble. But that's not the only reason, Joseph, that I did what my dad told me to do. I also did what my dad told me to do because I loved him. I wanted my dad to be pleased with me. So when my dad said, go out and, and weed the garden, we out in our front, in our front yard, we had a, a patch of garden where he had planted rose bushes and uh, he, had had some, he had an apricot tree on one side and an almond tree on the other side. And uh, I, he would say, okay, it's time to go out and weed that garden. Uh, and I, I would go out there and I would pull those weeds and I'd try to get every single one of them. And the reason I wanted every single one of them so that my dad would come out and my dad would say, David, you did a great job. David, you did a great job. We didn't get an allowance at our house. 
Dad didn't give us an allowance. He didn't believe in it. I said to my dad one day, can I have an allowance? He said, you want an allowance? He said, yeah. He said, I'll give you an allowance. I'll allow you to live here if uh, you do what I tell you to do. That was my dad's allowance. But I loved it when my dad would say, you did a good job. My dad, my dad uh, we, we, each, we had three patios that surrounded our house, and my dad would say, my dad gave me a, 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 a patio to, to sweep. That was mine. Every Saturday I was supposed to sweep the patio, and I tried to do the very best I could because I wanted mine to be better than Paula's, and I wanted my, mine to be better than Ricky's because I wanted dad to come out and say, man, David, I was the youngest and I, also the best looking. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I wanted him to come out and say, hey, you did a great job uh, doing that. I wanted my dad's praise. He was a big guy, so I respected him for that. He, he could spank me. I could respect him for that. But I just loved my dad. I loved my dad. I would crawl up in my dad's arms. He would rub my head, and he called me his little monkey. And uh, I didn't mind that. I loved that. I loved the fact that he loved me. I remember that. He went to heaven when I was 10 years old. I have dear memories of my dad. I did what my dad wanted me to do because I loved him. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, if, in, in John chapter 14, he said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Listen, he said, look, if you say you love me, then keep my commandments. We ought, to, we, ought to, we ought to give to missions. We ought to give for missionaries because the commandment says to do that. God's given us the commandment, and out of love, because we love him, we ought to keep that commandment. Number two, I'm going to be involved in giving to missions this year because of the commission. The commission. That is my responsibility. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, the Bible says this, God says, Paul said, now you are ambassadors for Christ. That's what we are here to do, to represent Jesus Christ. In Acts 1.8, uh, Jesus said, you're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Notice this. He said, you will be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. Hey, listen, I am a witness. I go out and tell people about Jesus Christ. This week, I passed out gospel tracts. Yesterday, I gave somebody a gospel tract. I give gospel tracts out everywhere. But you know what? I can't be everywhere. I can't go. How in the world is one man supposed to do what Jesus commissioned us to do? He said, go both that's at the same time, go to Jerusalem and in Judea, and at the same time, go to Samaria. How am I supposed to do that? I'm only one person. I can do that by being involved in faith promise missions, by giving to a local church, and sending Brad Edmondson all over the world. I can do that by, by, by supporting the Wyatts in Africa. I can do that by supporting the Friedensteins. And so when he leads someone to Jesus Christ, I'm doing that. I am going both in Las Vegas and into El Salvador and into Honduras and into all the world because we are sending money to do that. We go where we can personally and we send others where we cannot go. And that's the only way we can fulfill the commission. The commission says to go. Jesus said, and, and in Mark chapter 16, he said, I, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. How do I do that? Through giving to missions. So I'm going to give to missions because of the commandment. I'm going to give to, commission, um, to missions because of the commission. I'm going to give to missions because of compassion. His compassion the fact of the matter is that he left heaven and he came to this earth because we deserve to go to hell. The Bible says you and I, if you're in this room, anywhere in this world, we're all sinners. We deserve to go to hell. That's what you deserve, that's what I deserve, that's what we will always deserve. But he loves us in, in spite of the fact that we choose to do wrong, in spite of the fact that we're sinners, God loves us. And he doesn't want us to go to hell. But his justice says our sin has to be paid for. And so God, in his compassion, became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. 
And he came to this earth, and as a man, he suffered and died and paid the penalty of our sin in our place. He suffered the equivalent of hell for us. He was buried. Three days later, he rose from the dead, proving that he was God, and then he went back to heaven. Now he says, anyone can come to, 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 to him and say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know you're God. I know you died for me, and you were buried and rose from the dead for me. Please give me eternal life. I believe, and I want to ask you to give me eternal life, and I can be saved. That's his compassion. He cares about us because he doesn't want us to go to hell. That's what he did for us. Listen, his compassion motivates me to do what he wants me to do, even when I, when I don't know where the money is going to come from. Look, the Bible tells us this, that God has not given us a spirit of fear. In 2 Timothy, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I cannot let the fact that, that things aren't exactly the way I think they should be and the world's going crazy stop me from doing that which God calls me to do. His compassion compels me. You see, the truth of the matter is, why would Jesus leave heaven and come to this earth? Why would he do that? Because there's a real hell that people go to. There's a real hell where people are suffering. There's a real hell where people forever will be separated from God. In Revelation chapter 20, we're told about that hell. It says, I saw a great white throne. John saw this. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose, the, whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, that is those who are spiritually dead, those who are not saved, small and great, that is rich people, poor people, famous people, people that are not famous at all, small and great, stand before God. And the Bible says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into a literal lake of fire. Horrible thing. That ought to cause us to have compassion. People are going to hell. Do you know this, that people in hell, that are in hell right now, are begging for their lost friends to be told about Jesus? We know that because Jesus told us the story of a rich man who died and went to hell. And when he died and went to hell, he begged Abraham. He said, send Lazarus so, so that he'll go back and warn my five brothers not to come here. Look what it says in Luke chapter 16. This is Jesus telling the story. Jesus said, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto, unto to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. People will say to me, what I'm telling them about Jesus, that they don't want to die and go to hell. I've had people say, not very often, but I've had people say, well, uh, if I go to hell, that's great. I'll just have a party with all my friends. I want you to know if you have a friend in hell, they're begging, they're begging for someone to tell you not to come there. If you have a relative, a brother, a sister, a father, a mother that's in hell, they're begging, please tell my son, my daughter, my brother, my sister, my friend, don't come here. How do you get out of that? By calling on the name of Jesus. How do people around the world hear about it so they can escape hell? By us sending missionaries. We have a commandment. We have the commission. And when we have his compassion, we can't just let people go to hell. But I want you to see this. Our communication is the next reason we must give. Look again in verse 28 and 29. It says, there stood up one named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world which came to pass in the days of Claudius. Then his disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief, which they did. Communication, what do you mean by communication? Communication is not just words, but it's our deeds. It's what we do. It's, 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 it's not saying I love you, it's showing the love of Christ. In 1 John, John said this, but whoso hath his world's goods. You see, the people there in, in Acts, they didn't have much. 
and they had been suffering persecution and they'd been warned that more is to come. But right then, right then, right now, they had the ability to give. And so they were willing to take what they had and they were willing to give of what they did, did have. Whoso hath this world's goods and seeth his brothers have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? How in the world does the love of God dwell in somebody who sees a need and does nothing with it? That's what he's saying, wow. He's saying, look, there's no greater way to communicate the love of God by giving. Giving proves the love of God in it. It communicates to somebody the need. Why, was, why were those three ladies weeping? They were weeping because they were going to get their jobs back. They were weeping because somebody cared enough about them to travel thousands of miles to give them glasses so they could work to provide for themselves. Wow. That shows the love of Jesus Christ. And because the love of Christ is shown, people then want to receive him as their savior. How, how dwelleth the love of God in someone who, won't, who sees a need and won't do something to meet the need? Oh, listen, we, it is our way of communicating the truth, communicating the love of God. The Bible says very simply this in John three sixteen: for God so loved the world that he gave. Giving shows the love of God. It's our way of communicating God's love. Then I want you to see this, number five, my condition. I want to communicate the love of God. And I want you to understand, because of my condition, I'm able to. Look what the Bible says again. The Bible says, then, in verse 29, the disciples, every man, according to his ability. Every man determined they were going to do this according to their ability. What condition are you in financially? Where do you live? Compare it to what somebody else might have. You see, most of us have the opportunity of making a choice of what we're going to do with our money. We have an opportunity. I have the condition, I, I can determine that I'm going to use my money for one thing or I'm going to use my money for something else. I can determine that I'm going to care for people or I can determine I'm going to care for me. I can determine that I'm going to get involved in temporal things or I can determine that I'm going to get involved in eternal things. It all depends on on, uh, based on my condition, what I have right now, I can make those decisions. I, I, my wife and I like to go off-roading. My wife and I, have, uh, we have access to a Ford Expedition. It's a front-wheel drive Ford, but it's up, up off the ground. We love to go up into the mountains. We love to go out into the desert. We love to just drive off and see country. There's uh, uh, we've gone up Black Sheep Mountain, and, and it, it's about a 14-mile drive, and, and you, it takes you about four or five hours to do it in that vehicle. We would love to get a Jeep Wrangler. I, I, we've thought about getting a Jeep. Uh, we've, uh, uh, in fact, I've got a GoFundMe page. No, I don't. Uh, the, I, 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 we've, we've thought about getting a Jeep Wrangler, and we may. We may get us a, a Jeep. We may, get, we may do that in the future. You may see us driving but it'll be an old one that we can beat up some more because we like to go out. I don't want to just show what off. If I get a four-wheeler, I'm going to go four-wheeling. Uh, if I like going dune bugging, I like going ATVs out, we like that kind of thing. So why don't you get one? Because a long time ago, we made a choice. And, and again, we may get one. We've got, God's blessed us with all sorts of wonderful things, and we have fun doing a lot of different things. I just thought... I was just thinking about something that my flesh really wants. But a long time ago, my wife and I made a decision. I was on a bus one time, and this was after we had made this decision, but we were driving on a bus from a place called Mexico City to a place called Talapa. We were on a six-hour bus trip going up and down in, in the rural mountains of Mexico. It was just amazing. 
and uh, people were getting sick on the bus and throwing up on the bus. And I mean, it was just not a pleasant drive. We stopped at a place way, way out in the, out in the wilderness, a little town. We got out, and I, we needed to use the restroom. We went in to use the restroom, and man, it, the facilities were horrible. I mean, it was just, it was terrible. And I came out, and uh, I mean, flies everywhere. It was just bad. We walked out. I'm walking down the street, and I, I looked, and I saw over to my right-hand side. I turned around. There's a little girl there. Show that next picture. I saw a little girl, and she was sitting there. She didn't have a little doll sitting next to her. She was just sitting there all alone, and she had nothing. And I thought, what's the chance that that girl, I didn't know how to speak Spanish. I didn't have that opportunity. I thought, I can't tell her about Jesus. I can't even go and approach her because I'm a stranger from another place. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do. And my wife and I decided years ago that that little girl is more important than a wrangler or any other toys that we want. See, it's more important that that girl go to heaven. Can you say amen to that? Than it is that we have another toy to play with in America. My condition allows me to make a choice about where my money is going to go. So I'm willing to say no to certain things my flesh wants so that I can reach lost souls with the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, I'm, I'm going to give to missions because I have the ability to do that. Every man has the ability to give. This, in, this, in, this, in this tough situation, every man gave according to his ability. What's the ability you have? I just ask you to pray. God, what do you want me to do? Now, I've given you the reasons, the really good spiritual reasons for giving, but let me give you my selfish, self-centered reason for giving to missions. I believe this is the reason I have what I have materially. I believe this is the reason our church has what the church has, uh, uh, I, we, that we have. I believe that we have what we have because of this, this reason. His covenant. His covenant. My, my, my last point, his covenant. You say, what, what do you mean by his covenant? I am going to give two missions this year because of what God has promised to those who give. Over and over and over again, God's word tells us he will, it, it's, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Look at this in Acts. Uh, Paul is quoting in Acts, in Acts, there it is. I, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. It just is. It is more blessed to be on the, on the giving end than it is to be the person that has to say, would you please give to me? If you'd rather be in a position where you can give than, than, than in the position where you need to receive, say amen. You understand? I would much rather be in a situation where I have the ability to give to meet somebody's needs than to be the person saying, oh, I have a need. The Bible says, Jesus said, Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And that's true. It's true. To, it's a wonderful thing to give and, and watch three ladies go home that are able to see and say, man, I got to be part of that. It's more blessed to be part of that than to receive the glasses. It's more blessed to be able to see the blessing that you're, you are to others. That's why we have missionaries come in. That's why we have, you, you get to see what you participate in. It's more blessed to give to, than to receive. But that's true, not just in how you feel about that. I want you to understand it's true practically. God promised the Israelites that if they tithe, he would bless them. Look at it, this in Malachi. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. He's telling the Israelites, look, I commanded you to tithe. Now, if you do what I tell you to do, 
there will, that there may be meat in mine house so that my, the needs in the, in the temple at that time would be met. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. If you give, he said to the Israelites, if you give your tithe, and that principle I believe is true from before the law, during the law, and after the law. You bring your tithes and you give them to God, God is going to bless you and pour you out blessings you cannot receive. He said that to Israel. He also said to his disciples in Luke 6.38, he said, give and it shall be given. This is his covenant to his people over and over and over. You give and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. That's a promise from God. I'm telling you that's a promise to his disciples. You give, and I'll, I'll pour out blessings you're not able to receive. It's amazing. The idea is you plant one little kernel of corn, and from that, you give that one little kernel of corn, from that one little kernel will come a stalk, and it'll have four different ears of corn that'll have kernel, 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 kernel on there. God will mass produce what you give to him. Given it shall be given unto you. This is God's covenant to his people. The Philippian church was a church that supported the Apostle Paul as he went on missionary journeys. And Paul wrote back to them and said, he said, because you were faithful to meet my needs as a missionary, my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We don't have to worry about finances if we're doing what God tells us to do, if we're giving the way God tells us to do. God will take care of us. Can you say amen to that? That's God's word. That was to the church. He makes this, the promise to, to the Israelites. He makes the promise to his disciples. He makes the promise to a local church. And then he says it to us as individuals. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he says this. But I say this. But this I say. He that soweth sparingly, you give a dime you will reap also sparingly. You get two dimes. You understand that? You give two dimes, you get four dimes. You get four dimes, you get eight dimes. This I say unto you, he that soweth sparingly will reap also sparingly. But he that soweth bountifully, you give a, give a box full of dimes and, and you'll reap bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, let everyone decide in his own heart, this is what I want to give. So let him give, not grudgingly. Don't be the guy that says, okay, man, he's been talking about this for weeks. I'm just sick and tired of hearing it here. Take the card. You say, does that ever happen? Yeah, I had a guy walk into my office one day. He took my, the, his faith promise card. He said, I'm giving you this, and I don't want to hear anything more about it. I thought, man, keep it. Keep it, because the Bible says, don't give grudgingly or of necessity. Don't do it because you have to. For God loves a cheerful giver. He loves the person who gives and is thankful for the, oh, Lord, thank you that I have the ability to give back to you a little bit of what you've given to me. Man, that's the way it should be. The idea, the word, the word cheerful comes from a Greek word which means hilarious. So he's laughing. <laughs> oh, God, I don't know where that's coming from. But God, I'm going to give it if you give it to me. God loveth a cheerful giver. Now listen, listen to the covenant, listen to the promise. And God is able to make all grace, that is he's able to pour everything out on you, abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency, you'll have everything you need, may abound in every good work and you'll abound in the work that God calls you to do. You give as God leads you, and you do it with a heart that says, God, I'm so thankful to be able to give to you, and this is great. And God, thank you for giving, and God, I'm just going to trust you. You step out on faith, and you do what God wants you to do. God's covenant is he'll take care of your needs, and he'll do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. I'm going to give to Faith Promise Missions. I'm going to turn in my card today, and I'm doing it because it's a command. Number two, because of the commission. 
I want to fulfill God's commission. Number three, because of compassion for lost souls. Number four, I want to communicate the love of Jesus Christ. Number five, that my condition is such that I know I can and I'm going to. Number six, there's a covenant. God promises if I give, he'll give back to me. What we have at this church and what we have in our own personal life is because years ago, my wife and I learned to give, and this church has been a giving church. I would encourage you, get involved in Faith Promise today. Let's pray. Father, help us to take what we've heard. Help us to apply it to our lives. I pray, Father, that you would just allow us to reach more people, give more, and reach more people this year than we ever have before. I pray, Father, that you would touch people's hearts to get involved in faith promise. And Father, right now, if there's somebody here that's not saved, I pray they'll get saved right now. And Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Jesus said that all you have to do, or the word of God says, all you have to do in order to get saved is come to Jesus. Admit you're a sinner. The Bible says we're all sinners. And, and come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm sinner. I know I don't deserve to go to heaven. I want you to give me eternal life. Believe what Jesus did for you. You can call on Jesus right now. You can ask him to give you eternal life, and you can leave here knowing you're on your way to heaven. If you've never done that, would you do that right now? You can pray these words. I'll tell you exactly what to pray. Right now, you can pray these words, and you can ask Jesus to give you eternal life. Just say this, dear Lord Jesus, I know that you are God. And I know that I'm a sinner. And I know I don't deserve to go to heaven. But Lord Jesus, I believe you died in my place to pay for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead proving you are God. And right now, in the best way I know how, I call on you and ask you to be my Lord and my Savior and my God. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Help me now to live for you. If you just prayed that and you meant that, then you've become a child of God. We want to encourage you. I'll talk to you in just a minute. But Christian, let me ask you this. Are you involved in giving to missions? Would you just say to the Lord one more time right now, God, how much do you want me to give on a week-by-week basis to missions? Get involved in missions right now. Lord, what do you want me to give? And then take that card and fill it out. Father, I pray that you'll bless our efforts to raise money for missionaries. I pray, Father, that people will give and we'll be able to do more for missionaries than we've ever done. Father, that's a big request. But I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're glad you came to church this morning, say amen. Okay, right now I want to ask you to take that card out and I want to ask you to pray about, uh, you've been praying about it, Take that card out and just put the amount down that you want to give on a week-by-week basis. This isn't right now, one time, just on a week-by-week basis what you're going to give to missions over the next month. As you're leaving, uh, we don't take an offering anymore. We just ask you to drop that in the offering plate, uh, offering bucket as you're leaving. And then tonight, you say, well, if this is just between me and God and my name's no, and nowhere on there, then why am I filling out the card? Because your, you filling that out allows us to know what we should be giving, what we should plan to give to missions and what we ha- missions projects that we can or cannot support. It's our way of knowing so that we can move forward and uh, by faith and trust and, and do the things God wants us to do. So would you please fill that out? We'll announce next week what's come in uh, and uh, what's going to be coming in and what's been committed. So make sure you fill that out and drop that out. Now, we want to say this. If you, uh, if you are here today, you should fill out one of these cards. Uh, this is your connection card. This is the way we keep connected with you. We'd ask you if you are here for the very first time, if you on the top left hand corner would put first time. If you're here for the second time, would you please mark that? If you're a regular attender, mark that. If you're a member, mark that. Then fill out that card totally. On the back, 
This says, today I decided to receive Christ. If you just a moment ago prayed with me to receive Christ, this is very, very important. Would you please mark that on the top left-hand corner? I want to get a book to you. I want to encourage you, and I want to call you this week. Typically, during the week, uh, these cards are given to me. Last week, I was gone from Monday through Friday, so I didn't get a chance to call. But if you're here for the very first time and you received Christ, I want to contact you and just say congratulations and welcome you to the family of God. So please mark that uh, so that I can do that. And then uh, it says, please pray for. If you have a prayer request, please mark that. And then Pastor Matt's going to tell you about our connection classes, which take place tonight. And uh, I, I'm, uh, I encourage you to get that. I would encourage you to stop by and see the Edmondsons. I would, I, I would you know, I was, on, was doing a video today, and I mentioned you, and I called you Emlinton. Uh, Brad Emlinton, I, I preach in a church in Emlinton, Pennsylvania. I don't know if you've ever been, been there, but uh, uh, so... Brad Emlin something, and it's right over there. And make sure you see, and make sure you welcome the Friedensteins. Let them know how grateful you are that they are here. Get their prayer cards and pray for them. And uh, let's uh, continue to watch God do great things. Pastor Matt. It, uh, we'll help you pray for America over this next month. I think that we should all be in a season of prayer for our country. And so we have several hundred of these. Just as you are in your prayer time, uh, specific things that you can pray for your country with, I think it will be an encouragement to you. Take one of those, and there's other uh, discipleship materials, and then flyers to pass out inviting people to church. Uh, at this door, the Edmondsons will be over here, and the Friedensteins will be over here, so make sure you greet them and thank them for being part of our services today. Tonight at 5 o'clock, we will begin, uh, we, will, we will have again our connection classes. Last week, almost all of our connection classes were well attended, they were full, and uh, in groups of 50, we were able just to minister and fellowship unlike we've been able to since March. It was a great night of fellowship. And then we had Awana. If you have a child ages 2 to 12, who is looking for an opportunity to learn the Bible on their own level, that's tonight at 5 o'clock. And it was a great week last week. This week is our second week, and it'll start right at 5 o'clock. I hope that you'll be part of our services uh, tonight here on campus at Liberty Baptist Church. As the pastor said, at both of our exits, we have offering buckets to receive your faith promise cards, your offerings and tithes, and uh, your connection card this morning. We want to connect with you and let you know how grateful we are that you're part of our services today. Let's uh, close with prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for the privilege today to be in your house. I pray that you use what is said and done for your glory and allow us to return back to here safely tonight and next week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming. You're dismissed.